Hello, this is my face. Probably the first time you've seen my face on here and maybe the first time you've been on this channel. Um, I started this series analyzing In the Mood for Love by Wong Kar Wai and I titled the series Frame by Frame. Eventually I wanted to make it a series where I could simply just go through a film after film and just analyze it. Something similar to what you would see on um, Cinematography Database or uh, Wandering DP, which is uh, Patrick Sul Sullivan and Matt Workman's channel. So the other day I watched A Serious Man by the Coen Brothers for the second time. It was came out in 2009. It's, uh, the DP behind it is, of course, Roger Deakins. And I have the other people here. I have the production designer was Jess Gonachore, and the costume design was Mary Zofiers. So I would like to hop in. I'm gonna analyze about 11 or 12 shots. And uh, yeah, let's get right into it. Alrighty, so I'm gonna analyze these images in DaVinci Resolve. I'll be looking at lighting, exposure, composition, uh, production design, and color palettes. So for starters, I'm gonna start with this, this God's Eye View-esque type of shot. This is from the beginning of the film. And the beginning of the film opens with a Jewish family it's a older man and a, like a younger wife and they get visited by a rabbi it seems like it's about a hundred years before the actual film takes place but the uh the jewish man enters and his wife starts to believe that he's a dibuk or a ghost and she actually uh, kills him and then he laughs it's it's this weird dark humorous uh poetic type of scene but um, for starters, I love how the this opening scene for the film is completely separate than the rest of the film. Like, even when it comes to leveling right here, this is probably the darkest shot you'll see in the entire film, with just off the bat, which is you have their blacks hitting around zero, and then everything else peaks out about 25 IRE. And in terms of the composition, it's really nice. It has this um, separation between all the houses, right here and then the road just shimmies through um it's very similar to the i don't know if someone's seen the shot in uh fargo where it has a top view of the guy entering the parking lot and um this was shot by roger deacon so it is the same same mind behind it here but um it's just this very peculiar god's eye view almost dutch angle shot um to this that i really like and uh, we'll come back to this later. This will come up later. Uh, let's go to the next shot. Okay, so here's shot two. This is like an introduction shot to Larry Gopnik, who's the protagonist in the film. And he's getting a screening at his doctor's office, but what's really great about this shot is it's just a, it's just a blast of color and a blast of brightness to contrast the first scene, which was the, the dark, gloomy um, flashback type of scene. So, as you can see in the levels, it's bottom out around 5 to 0 IRE, just like the previous shot. But everything else is peaking around 85 to 90 IRE. It's not hitting 100, but it's, it's up there. So it's pretty much a full dynamic range scale type of image. And that's all thanks to these three fluorescent lights up here. Which I'm sure these are not actual fluorescent lights. They're probably swapped out for custom tungsten bulbs. That's what... Uh, Roger Deakins tends to do on most of his films and he even has a little bit back here, which is a uh, It's like a light panel. That's providing a nice backlight on this guy um, But as you can see the light is affecting the light above is affecting their, their skin right here It's almost kind of like a highlight and then I assume behind camera th this way Is some type of uh, soft ambient fill just lighting up the rest of the room it also could be one of those um, cove lights that Deacons has used before where it's like this sweeping cove of light, soft light, that envelops the room. But uh, yeah, it's, shots like these are, are really good because some people think it would be just like, oh, you just blast it with light and you get something like this. But really, it's, it's that slight difference between the lights above and the ambient light it's probably like a half stop or a stop i mean i can i can check right now let me get rid of that and i can throw this um this false color thing on it 
I only have the trial for this, so I just gotta wait a second for it to come over. Oh, there it goes. So, yeah. So I can see right here, their skin, the highlight area is hitting around white, which is around 70 or 80 yard IRE on this scale right here. Um, also, the funny thing about this false color tool is you have to pay for it, but you can literally just use the trial version and just deal with these texts on the front. <laughs> um, but yeah, as we can see, the light that's in the ambient light in the room that's filling in the rest of the scene is hitting pink, which on this scale is 60 or 70. So, so this from the difference between 60 to around 80 IRE or 90 IRE, that's about like a half stop. So it's just that nice half stop of light that's giving us this 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 nice difference right here on the skin tones where everything's kind of getting defined up towards the top of the scene where he's checking him. So really nice stuff. It's good. And in terms of the color here, this, I really like the color here. So, most people don't know this, but you can actually go to effects over here, and you can search color palette, and then drag and drop it on your node, and then just give it a second. Oh, there it goes. So right here, it doesn't want a full screen on me. <laughs> so there we go. So let's get the scopes out of the way. And... I can see right here, so this this is the mid-tone color scale, and this is the highlight color scale, and then the shadow color scale. And then on the bottom, we have right here, is the total color palette scale of the scene. So in the mids, we have some nice dark browns right here in the cabinets, and an olive green-esque, and then and the shadows are, are similar to the highlights, so we kind of get this like, bright green cyan blue, in the highlights and, and bright green side and blue in the shadows and then in the center we have the characters which is the skin tones the browns and the beiges so right off the bat the costume design in here production design it's all done to like this surgical clean edge that's what i really like about these coen brothers films is they get them they do stuff so simple like shot reverse shot which you'll see all the time on a coen brothers film but they just do little things on the frame that are just precise little tiny touches that most people would just gloss over. Most people would think, oh, it's a scene where he's in the doctor's office. Let's just put him in white walls and just put him next to cabinets and just have the doctor stand next to him and that's it. But they were like, no, let's paint the, the wall this, this color because this reminds us of the era and also the cabinets and the color and the whole color craft scale and the, uh, dare I say, mise-en-scene. <laughs> makes you feel like you're in the period right off the bat. And there's really nothing in the frame that tells me we're in that 1960s period besides the colors. So the colors are telling the story here, for sure. So let's go to shot three. So this is him in his in his home. Um, also, again, I love the color palette here. Uh, let me pop that up again. There you go. So, the scope's out of the way. So this is very much a brown scene. It's a brown verging on reds and oranges. But in terms of the whole scale as I calculate it, it's pretty much a brown into a beige and then do a brown in the highlights again. But now we're getting more types of stuff in the production design that tells us the period, like the lamp above, the, um, the window curtains, the paneled wood walls behind them you're very much getting that sense and once again you're also getting this classic roger deacon's lighting setup which is just a simple practical a nice looking period lamp probably with a replaced tungsten bulb probably at a certain wattage that he likes and then inside that tungsten bulb is probably some type of soft tissue or some type of diffusion added where you're getting the soft envelopment, envelopment of that table. So this table right here, as he lights down on this table, since it's soft, it's kind of enveloping the table. And then also when you when you light down on a table like this, since this is about a beige 
table would it's like semi reflective it's gonna reflect back up um also he has these uh blue papers as well that are also pri probably providing some type of fill light so you're getting the brightness of the the light closest right here on the top of his head and then right down here in this you can probably vaguely see it this part of his face that's a little darker that looks really funny that's getting filled in with the table light so it's just like a it's it's just one of these things that they do which is so simple but it just shoots down and lights it up like if you watch the film um, the Hateful Eight by Quentin Tarantino there's like 10 to 30 shots where they use a soft light shooting down on the table lighting up somebody um, and sometimes you can do it good enough that it when you get that you know pronounced under light which you'll see in like a film school class which you're like this makes a guy look dangerous or scary I mean they've they used that before in Hateful Eight obviously it done in this film but I'm gonna go to the next shot because it's it's paired with this one so here's uh, Cy Abelman. He's the basically the uh, the mistress of his of Larry's wife. He's cheating. He's cheating with Larry's wife, and he's trying to come in and and have a get, which is basically an agreed upon divorce. Um, a, a lot of this film center, centers around the the Jewish faith involved in their personal affairs. I mean, pretty much Larry's the main character just goes through hell and back throughout the film, but. Uh, whenever Sai is on screen, it's, it's pretty much comical. I mean, it's every time he's on screen, he's, he's always like commanding the scene and telling Larry what to do, and he's just gaslighting him, and it, it's it's fucked up, but it's also very very funny. So, as you can see, these highlights on his face right here. That's coming from, well, it's not coming from, but it's supposed to be coming from that light that we saw in the previous shot. But as you can see, this this is stuff like this makes makes Roger Deakin and his team so fine edged and tuned, as well as the Coen brothers, which is as you can see, this light is hard on his face, right? So we saw him in the previous shot sitting down at a table, and then you know, probably five, ten feet back, there's the door behind him that he walks around to get the door for Sai, right? But the light the further light travels away from a subject if you have like a like a soft lamp like i do here if i walk 10 20 feet away from it it now becomes a hard light actually the further you go away the harder the light becomes so you can actually take a really really hard bright light and you can stand extremely close to it and it becomes softer on your skin so you're trying to emulate the light as if he was standing on a door and as if that is the only that light in the house how would the light look as a side light and it would be a hard light it wouldn't be a soft light so it's just the little stuff like that that he figures out um and that's all the scene needs honestly it's like this is the first time you see his face why not give him a kind of a comical side hard light dramatic look and then i, I even love this too which is uh you can even see his his meshed reflection in the screen door and then of course they have simple like really nice like separation here in the frame with the door um, it's just these like that's what's so great about this film is there's just little things as you watch it It's such a pleasing film to watch cinematographically. I don't even know if that's a word, but <laughs> it's just It's just little stuff, you know, it just adds up. So let's go to the next shot So here's another scene where he's on top of his house like he's like fixing his cable antenna um, the thing about this scene is it's like he's I get the feeling from the scene. This is like them like seeping 1960s nostalgia because i'm gonna go to another shot here that's paired with it which is this if you saw this image and you showed this image to somebody they would automatically know what period you're in and automatically kind of have a feeling for what the movie's like because you have this this white man in plaid clothing silhouetted against a nice bright blue sky almost Kodachrome-esque blue sky with these popping white clouds. And I, I'm pretty sure this is on location, but this is like, it's just so picturesque and it just captures it all very easily. Um, but in this scene, he is, um, he's fixing his antenna and then he sees the, uh, the woman next door, um, sit, laying down on a, on a chair. She's actually 
she's tanning, but she's naked, so it's kind of like a pervy scene where he's looking down at her. But, um, honestly, a f something like this is just, it's just so simple, but it's so perfect. Like, the framing here is very, very much like a photographer would frame it, where you have this, uh, leading lines with the house and him looking down. And he's about, like, just off kilter of center frame. So yeah, it's just it's just really good simple stuff. So let's move on to the next thing. Actually, you know what? I should I should show you the levels on this. I forgot about that. So yeah, as you can see, everything's peaking bottoming out around zero, and then everything's peaking around 75 to 80 IRE. And if I switch if you switch this to the parade, you can kind of get a feel for the skin tones. So the peak and the reds is around 75 IRE and then around 60. If I pop the um, false color on here, I should be able to see a lot better. Yeah. So we got whites right here, which are around 80 or 70. And then we have pinks, which is around 60 to 70. So on average, you probably are around 65 to 70 for its skin tones on him. And then the background, you have this. Looks like a darker gray. So his skin is actually brighter than the background. So the background is about uh, 50 to 60 IRE, which is about, you know, about middle gray. So, and then the shadows are down by the trees. And in terms of the upper sky right here, we have a green, which is around 40. So it's actually opposite of what you would think. So when you look at this frame, you wouldn't think this is darker than this, but it is. Stuff like that, you know. All right. So I'm going to actually go to the next shot now. Alright, so this is the, this is one of the rabbis in the film. Um, this is, I wanted to bring this up because this is a great, great framing. This is this, like, distinct Dutch angle again that they keep using. Which is, whenever Larry's, like, all fucked up in the head, he doesn't know what to do. His wife's divorcing him, he's losing money, he's got a, his brother is pretty much, like, going nuts. He visits these rabbis as, like, a last-ditch effort to, like, orient himself in the world and a lot of the film talks about how like the Jewish faith has solutions to old problems but the new problems don't really line up with the old solutions like things like love yourself or God loves you don't worry about it stuff like that it's like all these new issues in the world do not really get presented with proper solutions from the old faith like there's things that that work for us but but this rabbi here, he explains the story of like a dentist finding Jewish script on the back of a guy's tech um, teeth, and he's like thinking of it as a sign. And it goes on and on forever. It's a, it's a freaking great scene. And he basically comes to this conclusion that like they don't know what it is, but maybe you should help people because maybe helping people is just worth it in the end, whatever. But uh, he, he, he starts to explain um, life's troubles as toothaches that they just like they rise up like crazy we can't understand them and then they go away but uh this shot here it just it really shows his uh psyche really well so uh, let me show you a little more of this so here we go on the levels everything's peaking around 70 re and then everything on the bottom is going around back to zero or five in terms of skin, it's probably similar to the last shot, but a little bit different. So, yeah, we have a little bit of pink here. So we have 60 to 70 on little spots of his face. And then most of his face is around 50 to 60 IRE. So, stuff like this is actually a good exercise because you're commonly taught to, like, expose Caucasian skin at 70 IRE. But upon examining, like, old films or any filmic like for example like the godfather for example if you take stills from the godfather and you put them in here and you throw a false color on it or you look at the waveforms you'll quickly find out that most caucasian skin to have like the, the filmic dare i say filmic look is is more in like the 50 to 60 ire scale which would be if you just had your light meter out and you took a reading where where it is on the light that would put the skin at middle gray which around 50 IRE so this digital look that we that we always try to avoid is actually more in like the high oh my bad <laughs> this digital look that we're trying to avoid is more in like the highlight scale 
which is like a you know 60 to 80 IRE scale, which is for skin, which is that's like the commercial end, right? We want to pull that down. And we get this filmic look. So this guy's skin is peaking around, as you can see in the reds, it's peaking around 67 IRE, and it's probably averaging around 60 or 58 IRE. And then behind him, the background, in terms of him opposed to the background, the background is only is only peaking around 25 to 30 IRE towards the mids. So he's getting around a, a stop or two difference between his skin and the background, which is a really nice, easy, easy way to have a filmic look, which is, you know, you're providing depth where the skin is the foreground and the background bottoms out with the use of exposure. So it's really good. So I got another shot here. This is another like kind of a Dutch angle in a way, but the way it's framed is uh, I think it's really coming out strong because of the use of lenses. I can only guess what lens this is, but it's probably like a 21 or a 24 millimeter. Um, you can find old interviews of Roger Deakins talking about his choice of lenses, and he tends to say that he favors the wider lenses like the 28 mils, the 35s, the 24s. And especially if you look at any of the Coen Brothers filmography, you can always get that distinct um, wide presence from the close-ups, which is which has to do with the depth of field and the wide lens. So if you shoot at it like a f4 or 5.6, then you have that medium depth, and then you you get in close with a minimal focal distance, um, you get this like strong presence. If this was shot at like a 75 or a 50, his face would be more compressed, and you probably wouldn't get as much as the texture or the depth on basically his like frustrated face here as he's looking down at a um, as a piece of paper. Um, but in terms of lighting here, it's just freaking great. You have like the reflections on his glasses here. You can see the papers through the glasses right there as well as here. And then also you have like in the last shot, you have a nice separation of brightness between his head and the background so if I put on the false color again um, you can see as well so the background is it looks around 70 going on 80 to 90 IRE and then you have 70 down to 60 here and then his his skin tones are in the 40s to fit actually it looks like his skins go from 40 all the way to 60 Actually, no, a little bit of 70. There's a little bit of pink in here, as you can see on the glasses. So if I take this off, sometimes it's hard to see. you got to turn it on and off. But yeah, the brightest spots of his face is probably the rims of the glasses. Um, it's hard to tell whatever light is being used here, but it's probably some type of um, top soft light because there's shadowing under his glasses right here. So a main way to figure out the light direction is just find the shadows and which way are they facing. I mean, that's really as simple as that. And uh, there's probably some accent lighting on the side that's lighting up his glasses. I mean, it could be from the window as well. But um, reflections like these are very hard to like pinpoint just from an image, like how they got it. So, but yeah. And I like to see the color palette on this because it's really just coming down to his clothing. Yeah. So here you have like a muted. Let me turn off the scopes. So here you have like a muted uh, palette, which is really nice. The skins obviously fall in the middle of that middle gray. And then towards the brighter highlights, we have like a gray bluish highlight tone. And then the bottom, it goes down into the grays, like pure grays for his uh, coat. So once again, it, it's fulfilling the 1960s color palette, but it's also fulfilling it emotionally, which is the, here's a down scene. So let's give, give him down colors as well. So let's move on to the next shot. Okay, so this shot is a continuation of the last shot. He's just now he's on the phone, but as you can see, they just they just pull the camera in just enough that they can have this like very strong presence. You can just be in his fucking psyche while he's on the phone. I mean, it's it's really working well. And color palette is exactly the same. He's wearing the same clothing. Now you just have a beige phone to match the skin. It's a good nice touch. Um, but but yeah, the reflections are a bit different here. On the glasses and stuff like that but but pretty much you have this you could fit this next to that rabbi shot where this is the it's the same kind of like dutch angle-esque close-up wide shot in your face type of shot that you'll see again and again in the film 
whenever you have a uncomfortable situation. So here, here's him in the uh, the neighbor's house, the, the woman that he was uh, perving at. Um, so he goes to her house and they smoke weed and talk and stuff like that, but it's pretty much just lost. So I love this shot because it's just simple. It's just him in a different space. He just sticks out like a sore thumb here because you can see that his... His color palette here does not match the rest of the scene. It does kind of in like contrast in a way, but but even when she enters the scene, these uh, the walls of of different scales of orange actually falls onto her uh, her person too. She has like an orange sweater and then I think a yellow dress, and it, it all kind of matches. So let me pop the color palette on this one. Throw the nodes on here. So as you can see, you have a dark brown turning into orange and then bouncing out. It's not really coming in as well on the color palette scale, but as you can see in this scene, like these bulbs right here, um, it makes it out pretty nicely. So also, again, you have these practicals right here which are probably swapped out for some nice bright tungsten bulbs and then the window is providing light on him that's probably some type of like uh, large tungsten source because again if he's using tungsten bulbs he has to match the um, the temp with the this is essentially the key light here so this must be tungsten because if, if this was HMI it would come out it would come out too blue probably and then also this is a little this is like a dimmer tungsten so this could easily be like a 2600 kelvin or a 2000 kelvin bulb and then these could be 3200 kelvin and this could be 3200 kelvin but these could be a little bit less you know you just want to play with that kelvin a little bit slightly so you can get a little bit of a warmer tone and then balance it out i mean it's common for films to shoot windows stuff like this with, a, with an hmi source which is a 5600 kelvin this is bright blasting source but um I'm thinking they went tungsten on this one. And in terms of the production design here, it's very similar as well, which is that they're cutting the frame at certain parts. Like this is the actual foreground. This would be the middle ground. And then he would actually be more of like the background here. And then the real, real background is this, this wall back here. So you have about four planes of focus in one shot. So you're just getting, this is just a simple wide shot of him waiting for someone to arrive. And you have four planes of focus, you have all this color dynamics going on, lights coming in, practicals. Stuff like this looks so simple to people, they just gloss over it. But this is, this shots like these actually take the longest to prep for people. Because you would actually just, you would prep all this, and then once this is all prepped, then you would go in for the close-ups. Where you could just brighten up the key light a little bit more move a practical to get a reflection on the ears you know stuff like that little things but this is a quintessential start with a wide shot type of shot all right so for this shot he's actually dropping off his brother um this is actually a dream here but it's a, another great example of a wide shot um for this one i just want to look at composition because it's just perfect so the tree obviously here is the foreground middle ground you have the car which is kind of a leading line leading to them, really nice. I mean, again, this is a film, so the trees, obviously, they're not choosing where they want the tree, but the car, they can put the car literally anywhere they want to make the shot. So they just pick the nice, you know, spot under the tree where you have this this closing of the frame by the, by the leaves here, and then that's kind of filling it out, and then you also have the car parked there pointing at them, and you can put them right there. And, of course, you can just wait for... The perfect time of day to shoot this this was probably like 3 or 4 p.m which you have that like late afternoon nice blast of sun so it's just a simple really simple gorgeous shot it's something you would actually see in um like towards the end of like shawshank redemption which is also what roger deacon shot that film so this is simple gorgeous shot it just really gets a, a feeling of freedom and bliss and but uh of course this gets counteracted at the end of this flashback you find out this is all a dream Okay, so for this shot, you have the son at his bar mitzvah. He's literally like high out of his mind, um, waiting to be called up to read the um, the script. But you have this like strong 
drugged look of the framing right here where you can only see him in focus and everything else gets blurred out which is it's very similar to um assassination of jesse james which was uh, shot by roger deakins as well which i need to cover it's like one of the best cinematography films of all time um but here you can it's very similar to that film because they have this like old vignette style where they only focus in on one character in this opening sequence that's just like gorgeous but here it's i think this same technique is used to a different effect it's some type of filtering or whatever i'm gonna have to look into it but but uh in terms of levels uh it's probably like yeah so everything's peaking around 70 and little bottom average towards 60 or 50 ire he also is the whitest person here so i assume if i put on the false color Yeah, he's hitting the highest, so he's hitting around that's uh, the 60s towards 70s right here, and the peak of the nose. And there's a little bit of more white spots here and there, but also I just noticed that the thing that's making him pop the most in the scene is his uh, his uh, religious um, ribbon or scarf around his neck that's a bright white compared to some of them it looks more beiged out a little bit. But yeah, just works. Let me go to the next shot. So here's like his point of view. I'm um, looking at another rabbi handing him this uh, this pen that they use to like read the script. I think it's like a follow pen. Um, and this is also the same technique of a shot, and it has a really nice blurred style where you're just seeing the pen and it's kind of blurring off to his face. Um, in terms of levels, it's probably very similar. Let me drag that on. Mess that up. All right, so. Yeah, once again, you're getting around 70 to 80 and 60 IRE on the scarves and the robes. And then the skins are kind of balancing out around 40 or 50 IRE, which is, again, that like filmic skin tone style that really works for this film. So, yeah. Over, uh, and then also, it is a Dutch angle as well. There's another Dutch angle here that's that's working for his, uh, his psyche. So, let me go to the next shot. So, this is actually the last shot I'm going to show you. Which is, um, this is the end of the film where Larry gets some unfortunate news about a possible cancer, I think. And basically, like, their own psyche worlds are kind of collapsing and everything's ending in a way. And things are kind of getting back to normal. But just as that happens, this massive tornado comes out of nowhere. And all the kids are sent outside. And it seems like all the plots of the film just come to a screeching halt. With this tornado coming it's almost like that it's just very biblical in a way just like the film tries to embellish onto us um and once again they 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 bookend it with a like this is this isn't the last shot of the film but it's probably in the last four or five shots of the film which is like this god's eye view of the american flag with the kids down kind of scrambling at the tornado and this is very very similar to this shot that we started on right here which is this God's eye view of this man entering his home, which is so I think there's like a key f point in the composition of the film where we have these very few God's eye view types of shots looking down at the characters. But then for the rest of it, we just go into their psyche and we fill the cinematography with their psyche because in a way you can shoot you can shoot in a third person view or a first person view. Most of the time we shoot in a first person view, which is we're shooting the the scene as the characters as the scene should be intended which is with the character's psyche so if you watch something like taxi driver for example that entire film is shot in travis bickle's psyche where you get the washed rain coming off the cars all the neon lights the blur the chaos of, of new york nightlife it's it's all within that character's psyche that's how the cinematography tells a story but very few shots in this film separate us from the characters and have give us this god's eye view and a lot of the film comments on is god real do these do these solutions in the old books even help us but in the end it wants to remind us that like if there is like this like all-seeing eye part of cinema which is we're, we're zooming up and looking down at them so um and also it, it ends on a shot behind behind the sun where he's just kind of staring into the tornado and you're kind of left to ponder pretty much all the questions that were posed in the film. So yeah. So that's The Serious Man. 
Hope it didn't go on too long. I hope this new format of frame by frame is helpful. So uh, yeah, if you like this video, sound off in the comments below. Um, all the hiccups and little things I did wrong in this episode, don't be afraid to tell me. I mean, I can fix my process. If you like the drawing, you want to get rid of the drawing, just, just let me know your thoughts on the video. And uh, we'll go from there. I'm thinking I'll probably do... I mean, I mentioned uh, Assassination of Jesse James. I can do that next. I mean, that would that'd be a great film to break down for you guys. Um, but yeah, I'd like to uh, jump right into more cinematography-focused content. Because that's what I do personally. I'm a cinematographer and a photographer. So I'd like to break down into that and kind of move away from video essays for a bit. And uh, focus more in on, like, quality-long content, analyzation type of videos. So, So yeah, let me know. I'll see you guys in the next one.